Hello, I'm Mrs. Sukanya Mohan. I'll be teaching you chemistry as well as biology. Today, we will start with life processes. What are life processes? Life processes are the processes that go on in all living beings. Uh, some of the life processes are growth, respiration, nutrition, excretion, transport, control and coordination and reproduction. So all these life processes take place in our bodies and help them, help all of us uh, with the different activities. We will start with nutrition. Nutrition is one of the basic life processes and it gives us energy for our various activities. Now nutrition uh, is very important for all living beings and there are different ways in which different living beings obtain their nutrition. Let us look at some of the types of nutrition. Basically we can divide the types of nutrition into two broad categories. One is autotropic and the other is heterotropic nutrition. Autotropic nutrition is found in plants. Plants can manufacture their own food with the help of sunlight, a green coloring pigment called chlorophyll and carbon dioxide. So uh, some bacteria also have green coloring matter in them and they are able to ma make their own food. So this is autotropic nutrition. We will learn more about it later. The other type of nutrition is heterotropic nutrition. Heterotropic nutrition is uh, nutrition other than autotropic. So these cannot manufacture their own food. They depend on plants and other sources for food. One of them is parasitic. You can see the picture of a mosquito sucking human blood. Now the mosquito in this case is a parasite and the host is the human being of course not a very willing host and the mosquito too is not a welcome guest. Uh, when the mosquito sucks the blood of the human being it gets the digested food which is there in the blood and it takes the digested food and um, uh, when it sucks the blood its saliva puts some germs it may be carrying into our bodies and we may get diseases like malaria and uh, other vector bone diseases. So the, uh, this kind of nutrition where one organism uh, depends on another organism for food and causes it harm is known as parasitic nutrition. The next type of nutrition is saprophytic nutrition. Saprophytes are organisms which depend on other organisms for food but they do not grow on living organisms. They grow on dead and decaying matter. You must have seen some mushrooms growing on uh, logs of wood uh, or you must have seen black spots on bread slices when you leave them out in the uh, air and moisture. You see black specks. All these are saprophytes, examples of saprophytes. You see mushrooms growing on the barks of trees. So they get their food from dead decaying matter. Another type of nutrition is herbivorous nutrition 
which you see in grazing animals like the cow or the giraffe etc. Now these uh, get their food from plants and the next group is the carnivorous animals which derive their nourishment indirectly from plants because they eat the herbivorous animals which are dependent on the plants for their food. So examples of carnivorous animals are the lion, the tiger etc. There are some plants which are carnivorous too. Uh, for example the bladderwort and the pitcher plant. Now as you can see in the picture the pitcher plant looks like a pitcher with a lid on top. It is a leaf has formed the pitcher. Now this pitcher has glands which secrete digestive juices. The juices come out and they shine like dew drops in the sun. Insects are attracted to the dew drops and they land on the pitcher. When they land on the pitcher the insect glides down into the pitcher and uh, the lid of the pitcher closes. When the lid closes the digestive juices act on it and they digest the um, insect. After the digestion is over the undigestible parts like the wings are thrown out the pitcher. The lid of the pitcher opens and these are thrown out. You can see the same process happens in the bladder wart. In this case the leaf has those uh, drops of digestive juices. When the insect lands on the leaf, the leaf closes and traps the insect inside. The insect is then digested and undigested parts are thrown out. So uh, we also talked about parasites. Uh, we gave you the example of a mosquito. There are several other parasites. For example, the tapeworm. The tapeworm is a parasite which lives in the intestines of man and gets the digested food directly from the intestine. Uh, there is the leech. The leech sucks the blood of human being and gets its nourishment from there. There are some plants which grow like parasites on other plants. Cascuta is one such example. So these are some of the types of nutrition that we come across in different living beings. Let us now learn a little more about autotrophic nutrition that take place in plants. You know that plants are the food factories for the whole world. They not only make food for themselves but provide food for animals and human beings as well. How do they carry on this process? The process is known as photosynthesis. You can see in the diagram an outline of how the process of photosynthesis takes place. The photosynthesis process uh, takes place in green leaves. The leaves have a green pigment known as chlorophyll which is very essential for photosynthesis. The leaves also have small holes in them called stomata through which carbon dioxide enters the leaf and oxygen which is formed as a result of photosynthesis leaves the leaves. And, uh, this carbon dioxide which enters the leaf reacts with water brought from the uh, soil by the roots and the xylem vessels. The chemical reaction takes place and 
starch is formed as a result first glucose is formed later on it's converted to starch and oxygen is given out during the process so we see that for photosynthesis we need chlorophyll carbon dioxide and water as well as sunlight so we will be doing a few experiments that prove that these factors are necessary for photosynthesis the first one let us uh, check if chlorophyll is needed for photosynthesis for this we take a potted plant with variegated leaves you can see in the diagram the plant with the variegated leaves what is a variegated leaf variegated is a leaf which does not have chlorophyll uh, throughout the leaf uh, may have uh, some parts uh, of green and the other parts may be red or yellow or some other color so chlorophyll is not found in all the parts of the leaf we take such a potted plant and we leave it in a dark room for 3 days why do we do this we do this to remove all the starch which is already present in the leaf we want a leaf without starch to see if starch is actually being produced during the experiment so if we keep it in the dark room for 3 days all the starch in the leaf gets used up by the plant now we bring the potted plant outside in the sun and leave it there for 5 to 6 hours photosynthesis will take place now we have to test if photosynthesis has actually taken place we pluck a leaf from the plant now this leaf mark the green areas in the leaf and trace out the leaf on a sheet of paper to show which areas had chlorophyll in them now we boil this leaf in water the cells will be killed by boiling then we boil the leaf in alcohol alcohol dissolves the chlorophyll in it we do not boil it directly in alcohol because alcohol is highly inflammable so we keep alcohol in a water bath indirectly we heat the alcohol put the leaf in it we will see that the alcohol becomes green in color now take out the leaf from the beaker wash it with water to remove the alcohol keep it in a watch glass or crucible and add a few drops of iodine you know that uh, this is a test for starch iodine turns starch blue black now after adding the iodine look at the leaf you will see that some areas of the leaf have become blue black in color and now match it with the drawing that you made of the leaf you will see that those parts of the leaf which were green in color have turned blue black showing the presence of starch and the rest of the leaf does not show the presence of starch so this experiment proves that uh, starch is prepared only in presence of chlorophyll we will now look at another experiment to show that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis we take two potted plants which are almost of the same size and next to one plant we will keep a container containing potassium hydroxide potassium hydroxide absorbs carbon dioxide so 
then we cover both the plants with a bell jar and we seal the base of the bell jar properly so that no air can enter the bell jar or leave the bell jar. Now as before we have to de-starch the leaves. So we keep the both the plants in a dark place for 3 to 4 days. After that we remove the plants from the dark place and keep it in the sunlight for 5 to 6 hours. All the starch in the plant would have been utilized and now in the sunlight it will manufacture uh, starch. But let us see if the leaves from both the plants manufacture starch. After 5 to 6 hours we pluck a leaf from each potted plant. We take these leaves and we follow the same procedure for testing for starch that is we boil the leaf and uh, we put it in alcohol to remove the chlorophyll and then wash it off and put some drops of iodine on the leaves. Now we have to really identify which leaf is from which plant. We have to mark the leaves as A and B. Now when we add iodine to each one what do you expect? You can obviously guess which leaf will have starch in it. The leaves of the plant which got carbon dioxide show the presence of um, starch. They will turn blue black that is the second plant not the one where potassium hydroxide was kept because potassium hydroxide takes away all the carbon dioxide from the air, the plant does not get carbon dioxide, hence the plant cannot manufacture starch. So this experiment tells you that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. We will now see how nutrition takes place in some unicellular organisms. Now unicellular organisms bodies are made up of a single cell. All the life processes should be carried on in that same cell. So we will see how it takes its nutrition. This organism known as amoeba can put out pseudopodia in any direction. Pseudopodia are false feet. That is the organism can put out feet in any direction it wants. When it sees a food particle, it puts out pseudopodia to try to engulf the food particle and then it digests the food particle. The waste products are thrown out through the body surface. Uh, so other unicellular organisms also carry on the process of nutrition and digestion within a single cell. There are uh, these uh, organisms which have cilia or hair like structures. These by moving bring the food matter near the organism and then it uh, digests it by forming a food vacuole around the uh, particle. So uh, the now we will be looking at digestion and nutrition in higher organisms which are more complicated have tissues and organs for digestion. We will now look at the process of nutrition in higher organisms including man. What is nutrition? Nutrition involves ingestion that is taking in of food, digestion of food and assimilation. Assimilation is important because the digested food needs to be absorbed by the body and then broken down into simpler substances with the release of energy. 
this energy is used by us for various activities. So, uh, we will see how food is taken in and digested. The digestive system starts in the mouth. You must have noticed that the very thought of tasty food brings water or saliva into your mouth. So, that is showing us that the body is ready to digest the food that you are going to take. The salivary juices come out into the mouth to digest the food. Now, uh, the teeth chew the food, so they break up the food into smaller bits. The saliva mixes with the food, the tongue helps in this process. The lining of the mouth has mucous membrane in it which helps to kill any germs entering the body through the mouth. This uh, food then is converted into a bolus or a ball like round structure and it is swallowed. The mouth leads into a tube or the esophagus. The food canal or the gut or alimentary canal lies right next to the windpipe. It starts with the mouth and ends at the anus. The mouth leads into the esophagus which is a long tube passing through our neck to the stomach. The esophagus uh, does not have any uh, glands which secrete digestive juices. We saw that the mouth has uh, some digestive glands, the salivary glands which give out saliva. Saliva contains an enzyme called tylen or salivary amylase which converts starch into sugar. So, if we keep uh, substance, food substances containing starch for a long time in our mouth, we will feel that they taste sweet. For example, a slice of bread, if you chew it long enough, it will start tasting sweet because the starch gets converted into sugar. So, when this food goes down the esophagus, there is no other juice acting on it. The saliva from the mouth continues to act on the food. How does this food go down the esophagus? You can see that the bolus is being pressed from top. There is a constriction above the bolus and then uh, below the bolus, the canal expands allowing the food to go down. This kind of movement is known as peristalsis and peristalsis occurs all through the digestive tract. That is how food moves from one part to the other. The food then enters the stomach. The stomach is a bag like structure which is elastic, it can stretch when needed. The food enters the stomach and the stomach secretes gastric juice. The wall of the stomach is lined by gastric glands which secrete gastric juice. The gastric juice contains hydrochloric acid. Now hydrochloric acid has two functions. It kills the germs that may enter the body with the food and it also makes the medium acidic. The enzymes need a particular medium to act. The enzymes in the stomach need an acidic medium to act. So, the hydrochloric acid uh, changes the medium into acidic medium. What are enzymes? Enzymes are proteins in nature they act on a particular medium and they help 
to break down the food into simpler substances. In the gastric juice, there are enzymes which will break down the proteins into peptides and proteoses and other simpler substances. The food remains in the stomach for 4 to 5 hours. During this time, it is digested by the enzymes and the food uh, is kept in the stomach for this period of time because there is a pyloric sphincter at the end of the stomach at the part where it is uh, it uh, opens into the small intestine that sphincter is closed so when the food is ready to go into the intestine the sphincter opens and the food goes into the intestine the intestine small intestine it is called small intestine but actually it is very long if you keep it straight it will be four or five times your height so uh, this is meant for increased surface area for digestion and absorption and it is called small intestine because it is narrower than the large intestine which is broad. The small intestine has three parts. The first part is U-shaped and is known as the duodenum. The second part of the small intestine is the uh, jejunum and then the ileum. Now, uh, the small intestine also has intestinal glands which secretes uh, intestinal juice to digest the food. And the first part of the small intestine or the duodenum gets uh, juices from two glands. One is the liver. The liver is the largest gland in the body and it secretes bile. The bile is temporarily stored in a pear shaped gland called the uh, a pear shaped organ called the gallbladder and you can see the common bile duct coming out. This carries the bile to the small intestine. The pancreas also pours its secretion into the duodenum through the pancreatic duct. These juices contain different enzymes to digest the food. The bile makes the medium alkaline because you know that food in the stomach was acidic. The enzymes in the intestine will not act in an acidic medium. So the bile makes it alkaline. And the bile also emulsifies fat. What does that mean? It means fats are broken down into smaller particles for the enzymes to act. The pancreatic juice has an enzyme called trypsin which breaks down proteins into simpler substances. So by the time the food leaves the small intestine, it is fully digested. The process of absorption also takes place in the small intestine. The uh, small intestine is adapted for absorption uh, by the presence of small finger-like projections. These finger-like projections called the villi, plural is villi, singular villus uh, help uh, in absorption of food. The digested food is absorbed by the villi. There is a lacteal in the villi which helps to absorb fats. Now what are the end products of digestion? Starch is converted into glucose. Proteins are converted into amino acids and fats are converted into fatty acids and glycerols. So these substances are absorbed by the body and 
they provide energy for various processes. During respiration, these substances are broken down and the excess is stored in the liver for future use. The undigested food goes into the large intestine. Uh, the large intestine has three parts an ascending colon uh, which goes up then transverse colon which is horizontal and then the descending uh, part of the large intestine. The last part of the large intestine is known as the rectum where undigested food is stored temporarily before it is thrown out of the body. So, this is the, uh, how the process of digestion takes place in human beings. You must remember that the food should contain enough fiber in it to help in the process of digestion. Otherwise, the person will be constipated. So, uh, even the waste product uh, of digestion uh, needs some fiber to increase the bulk so that it is easier for them to be removed from the body. We will now do a simple experiment to show the action of saliva on starch. We take two test tubes A and B and uh, put 2 ml of starch in both of them, in each one. Now add some saliva to the first test tube or test tube A, but not to test tube B. Shake it well and leave it aside for a while. After that, we add a few drops of iodine to both the test tubes. What do we see? You know that starch, iodine turns starch blue-black. So when you add iodine, you will see that the first test tube A, which contains saliva, does not show blue-black color, whereas the second test tube containing saliva shows, uh, which does not contain saliva, shows uh, blue-black color. Now this is because in the first test tube, the starch was digested by the saliva. So there is no starch left in the first test tube. It does not change blue-black in color. The second test tube had no saliva, so the starch was not digested. Hence, it gives the test for starch. It becomes blue-black in color with iodine. 